Hello and welcome to another Cloud Podcast, a podcast designed to bring you stories from the smartest minds in IT, operations, and business, and learn how they're using cloud technology to improve business and the customer experience. All right, all right. Well, we are so excited today to have Michael Jones, and I've been waiting for this podcast for quite some time now. Uh, Michael Jones is the Senior Director of Customer Care over at Home Depot. He's the one that gets it done. Michael, welcome to the show. Great to be here, Alex. Thanks for having me today. Absolutely. Good to have you. And Artie, of course, you're always with me, buddy, to co-host this wonderful podcast. Good to see you. Nice to see you as well. And Michael, uh, welcome to the podcast. Uh, Looking forward to the conversation today. And I'll just jump right in. Uh, Michael, give us a little background of your, your history with Home Depot, you know, where you started and where you are now and what you oversee. Sure, I, I will give you the uh, the shortened uh, executive summary version because I've been with the company for 26 glorious years. Uh, and uh, I think your listeners may nod off if I told the story of each one of those years. But <laughs> the short the short version is that I started with the Home Depot, uh, like so many others, um, not after a career in retail, but, uh, but taking a break uh, from college and was looking for a summer job. And that was June of 1995. Uh, and throughout the growth of the company, when I started at that point, there was around 370 some odd stores is over 2000 now. Uh, and that growth and that, uh, opportunity took me from California to Florida, to Colorado, to Arizona, to Wisconsin, to Colorado, uh, and then ultimately to, uh, to the Atlanta store support center where our primary offices were located. Uh, I've done a number of jobs within the stores for the most part for my first 15, 16 years. Uh, a little bit detours into internal audit and asset protection, loss prevention, but ultimately uh, came into this most recent role, uh, running contact centers after about running our rental business for about five years. So had a had a broad and diverse career, uh, running P and Ls, operating as a regional uh, leader, operating as functional leaders, and and ultimately um, ultimately running stores as well. So it's been a it's been a great journey, a very diverse journey. A uh, lot of different steps along the way, and uh, certainly not a day goes by where I'm not pulling on some of those some of those learnings over the years to my current role as senior director of customer care for the Home Depot. Yeah, absolutely love that that background, and it's not often where we have someone that has been with the company for so long, and not only that we've been there for 26 years, but you've seen the company go from it uh, how it's a lot smaller with only you know still a lot of stores. But sure. it grow into this behemoth of a of a store and a and an institution. It's more than just you know tools tools and wood at these stores now, and with the rental divisions and all those sorts of things. So let's dive a little bit into since you know the the contact center, the customer care. How is that? How have you seen that evolve from a company standpoint from when you were there, even though you weren't working in that department, to where it is today, and and how how that evolution kind of happened for for Home Depot? Yeah, sure. I think I think like most um, like most customer care centers, uh, we probably started as a as an outcome of a bunch of different people getting phone calls and not really given a good customer experience. And so starting starting off with, hey, how do we have a great customer experience no matter where the customer calls for support mm-hmm. after sales service follow up and of course complaints is a part of that as well. Um, and out of that customer care was born in the early days of customer care, uh, actually, and it's a, it's a worthwhile story to tell actually had a, had a start where Bernie Marcus and Arthur Blank, our founders, um, there was a road going to and from the airport in kind of an area of Atlanta called Ben Hill. And they thought that would be the, that would be a great name for our customer care representative. And it was kind of a code speak. So that whenever a customer in those early days would call up the, the I'm sure it was a switchboard at that time, uh, would call up the switchboard and they would ask for Ben Hill. That was a an alarm bell that made sure that whoever was answering the phones would transfer it to Bernie, Arthur, Ron Brill, our CFO, or Pat Fair, our chief merchant at the time. And no matter what was going on, they would stop that meeting. No matter what was going on, they would take that call from the customer. 
And so in the early days, we weren't called customer care internally. We were called the Ben Hill Group, uh, uh. Taking, our, taking our name from that early kind of process. Of course, you know, over a period of time, you grow and you start staffing it and putting systems and processes in place. But I think it's a, it's a, it celebrates our values of taking care of our customers. When you go back to even those early days, our founders, our chairman, our executive leadership team would personally take those calls from our customers. Yeah, and I've, I've been a customer of the Home Depot for, oh man, 20 years plus, and I've, I love going to the store, you know, touching everything, seeing everything, the smell of lumber, um, being greeted by someone with, you know, the orange apron on, an expert. That's, that's an amazing experience. Um, and now in recent years with not only online e-commerce and the ability to price check and look things up online while you even in the store on your phone, um, having that service available at the touch of a button to talk to someone really quickly and just pick up the call and, and, and answer any questions they may have. Have you seen seen a big shift in, you know, in your consumers wanting to go that way? And if so, what does it look like in the for the future? Is has it been easy to adopt that or is it has it been hard? It's a great question. We we've certainly seen a shift you know, going back to the early part of the century where, you know, online used to be 1%, it would slowly grow, you know, a percent a year. And then March of 2020 happened. And we had about 10 years of acceleration uh, over the last 18 months. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you think about the, the customer expectations had already been changing. They had already been expecting, you know, no friction and an effortless experience. Um, you were already seeing, you know, folks grow tired. I've got to stand in line to make a payment. Why would I ever do that when I can just click something on my phone? Mm -hmm. um, and so that that was already creeping into into our customers' mindsets. We'd already been down the road in a lot of areas to simplify uh, the transactional experience in our stores, simplify the selling process in our stores. Stores, but certainly the shift, the massive shift to online was something that because we had already been preparing for that as part of the evolution, and quite honestly, several years prior, we made significant investments in our supply chain, into our websites and our distribution facilities to enable that, that coming change. When it happened, we were very uniquely positioned to be able to take advantage of it. Um, probably more quickly uh, and more so the, than other retailers otherwise would have been. And so it became it became a competitive weapon for us. It became a good thing for us. But specifically in terms of the consumer behavior, you know, in the past, roughly 40 percent of all of our online sales went through a store in some way, shape or form by online pickup in stores, mm -hmm. the most common one. Now it's over 55 percent. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll go through the store. So the, the blending of the brick and mortar in the virtual worlds uh, is still happening, but it also underscores why it's even more important than ever to have a unified experience for the customer. And it's, it cannot be disjointed. Yeah, I think it's absolutely imperative that, you know, the leadership team and yourself and, you know, the, to see, to have the vision to see where it was moving, because there are a lot of companies that were caught you know, with their pants down for lack of sure. a better term when, sure. the, when the COVID hit. Right. And I love the shift from this, you know, supply chain model, this distribution center. Now kind of like how Walmart took over years ago and Sam Walton started, he just had these little distribution centers and now Walmart, same thing. Right. And what I want to ask is like, what, what are some of the challenges that, that that's created just internally for you and your team to solve for as people just rushed into this, you know, e-commerce realm and, but also still going into the stores and how to, you know, marry that together. Yeah, sure. I think I specifically for, for, for us and my team, Alex, I could, I could share with you a, a very broad world of challenges. I think, you know, I would, I would, I think through this in phases. So the, the, the first phase of, of COVID was, um, you know, for us, it started really in April. Uh, this is following kind of lockdown modes where people started sitting in their house, looking at their walls and saying, you know, I'm going to paint this room. And the entire country decided roughly 300 million people, I think, in the same month to go out and start painting their house. Um, and so for us, it was making sure that we were able to 
to supply that incredible demand in a time where we really weren't expecting that. And you could you could take paint in the early days. You could look at outdoor swing sets and outdoor pools and yeah. kitchen cabinets and projects and as all of that played out. But in the middle of all that, it was incredibly important um, to us that we also made sure our associates were safe and that they were they had any anxiety or concerns reduced. And I think, you know, mm. for us, we moved several thousand people in a couple of weeks out of call centers um, in, in Ogden, Utah, and Tempe, Arizona, and Kennesaw, and Atlanta, and in all of our third parties, you know, moved them all out uh, and, and got them home <laughs> and got them working. We had always had a piece of our business that was a work from home footprint, but never a hundred percent work from home. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we were able to quickly uh, do both, take care of our people and get thousands of people home within a couple of weeks as volume and demand were spiking. And like anybody else, we had our challenges during that time, but I'm, I'm incredibly proud of the organization that we were able to, to make it through those challenges. Now, the challenges are more, you know, ongoing volume shifts and really how do we, how do we plan and make sure that we give an absolutely outstanding customer experience wherever they, uh, wherever they come into us, whatever channel they decide to use. I'm going to drill into that a, a lot because I, I love team culture. I love team economics, especially when, when there's a lot of change. Um, I used to have a friend, family friend who worked at Home Depot until he retired. He was a, the Home Depot employee for about about 20 years. Um, you guys create a very loyal uh, employee base. So let's talk a little bit about how you do that. Like what, how do you love, create a team culture? To. And let's, let's talk through that. Yeah, I'd love to. I, I wouldn't be here 26 years later if, if, I, if I wasn't passionate. So I've drank the orange Kool-Aid. I bleed the orange blood. Um, so I, I, am, I am probably the most biased person in the world. You can ask that question. So you'll get a, you'll get a biased answer for sure. Um, look, our founders gave us the greatest gift they ever could have given us, which was a set of eight core values. Um, and I could run around the entire wheel. Uh, I don't have it tattooed on me, but it's something <laughs> that is embedded into, into my brain. But certainly our focus on core values when it comes to taking care of our people and taking care of our customers are two of the kind of founding tenets. And it is it shows through in everything we do and every decision we make. But I'll share with you one story that kind of crystallizes our belief um, as a company. In the early days of the pandemic and in, in March of 2020, we were having the, we were having daily and twice daily calls with our executive leadership team. And this was CEO, C-suite, executive vice president, C senior level executives within with all of our regional vice presidents everyone on a call twice a day coming together to address all of the issues in the morning to mention everything and then by that afternoon it mm -hmm. was the store support centers and the executive leadership teams and the business owners their job was to report back out to the field leaders here's everything that we're doing so we have a management construct called the inverted pyramid where we put our customers at the top and our associates just below them at the very bottom of that is our ceo and our executive leadership team you saw that management construct play out every single day because basically it was our field leaders saying, we need pick a list of 100 items. And then by that afternoon, here's what we're giving you. And it's everything. And this was product, process, system, safety, governmental involvement, all of that. Wow. So we saw that play out every single day. But in the very early days, week one, first, first several of those calls, our chairman and CEO, Craig Manier, got on. And I'll never forget this. He said, he said a profound statement. He simply said, we will manage through this time in a way that will make our founders proud. We will run this company as if they are still running it today. We will focus on two things, the safety of our customers and the safety of our associates. We will not care about anything else. We will not run it for the short term. We will run it from the long term. Now, at that point, we still had competitors that had full open doors that mm. were still running spring, spring black friday ads that were still inviting people into their stores and we canceled all of that and we said no that's not us we restricted traffic we removed marketing dollars and i would tell you guys that that crystallized for me as a leader okay that's my marching orders that's my priority and i can execute against that easily 
And in the following weeks after that, when we had to move everybody from to from the office to the house, we had to outfit them with all new equipment and gear because some of the stuff wouldn't, you know, wasn't good for unplugging and plugging back in. Mm -hmm. You know, I spent a material amount of money. No one ever asked me what it was. I never had to have approval for a single thing. Mm -hmm. Never had to ask, never had to submit anything. We just did it. And coming from the top, having that kind of culture that's focused on the right things in a management contract that su supports the velocity with which we needed to move. Again, we were uniquely positioned to be able to take advantage of that. That none of that happens without a without a real culture that's established within the organization. And we saw it play out time and time again. I could give you many more stories like that, but certainly that time yeah. and that period, when I look back on it, highlights uh, what kind of culture we have at the Home Depot. Yeah, I absolutely love I love those stories. And I love hearing when the big corporations can still hold true to their core values. A lot of times you see them listed on the walls and it's just there, but no one's really taking it to heart. The lead, and it really all comes down to leadership. And what's amazing about hearing this is from the founders to the existing um, you know, C-level and board members is that they held true to that original value that when Home Depot started. I just think that's amazing that they can they can keep it, keep that, carry the torch into the future, right? And it just it just shows. And I know you guys talk a lot about taking care of your people. And you know, people always say, you know, customers are first and whatnot, but I, I people regardless are important, but of course your your own employees are too, right? And it's like I think you with that mindset, it's only going to make the customer experience better. So it's almost it's just it just happens on the customer side. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, another another quote from our founders, um, it, Bernie Marcus said, "If you take care of the customer, or take care of the associate, and they take care of the customer. Everything else takes care of itself." Uh, and yeah. that that really is true. You cannot possibly have ever that I've seen sustainable a great customer experience without having an associate that also feels really good about the organization that 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 they're working for, they're working with. Mm -hmm. um, they can do it for a day or two. But ultimately, over a period of time, if it's not real, it's not genuine. That's going to come through. That's going to come through in the customer experience. So it's got to you got to do both. But it starts with the associate for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, and and given an example, I mean, I've walked into the home. I probably go to the Home Depot probably every week, <laughs> maybe Thank maybe you. twice Thank a week. Thank you. And I every time I go there, there's two things I notice. One, there's always an associate around that I can ask a question of, and they're, they're, they they look at me straight in the eye and say, I'm going to help you until I I find what you need and solve your problem. It's, it's a full carry through of, you know, I need this nail. They're, they'll walk me over yep. to where that nail is and ask, is this the right one you want? If not, let's go look for another. Um, and there's always people available. And the other thing I noticed is there's always a, a lot of safety. You, Oftentimes when you're in the Home Depot, you forget that you're in a warehouse where there's mm. things above your head that can fall on you, which won't because there's safety precautions and, you know, they, they close down the lanes and all that. Yep. Um, I oftentimes forget that. But those are the two things I always notice. So my question is, in, in on your team, as you're doing more of a, a contact center over the phone or, you know, through other channels, how do you carry that through? How do you continue to have that amazing level of service, uh, walking people through maybe purchasing online or doing a return or scheduling a pickup? How, how what, what are the, the core tendencies to, to make that work? Yeah, I, I, it's a great question. I think first and first and foremost, this is where, you know, it, it's it's hearts and minds and people need to understand their role. And, and for us, it is to make sure that if a customer contacts us, regardless of the the trigger for them contacting us, whether it is, you know, I need to follow up and get a part order and I need to follow up on an order status or I need to I'm really upset uh, because we don't get it right all the time um, and, I, and I want to complain that associate carries the banner of the Home Depot behind them. And, you know, the, the, the banner says one word, and it says empowerment. That associate is empowered to be able to do whatever is right and aligned with our values and legal to take yeah. care of that customer. Um, I, I've often said, and I say this in all of the new hire classes that I still speak to, albeit virtually, is that you're all experts at this job. And they'll, they'll, they'll kind of look at me and there'll be that pause. I'll say, no, no, really, you are all experts at this job. Again, look at me, kind of pause. And I'll say, because you've all had an experience where somebody said, I can't help you. 
-hmm. So don't ever do that. Make sure that you know that you have the full backing of myself and my leadership team to do whatever it takes to make it right for the customer and to follow it through. And that means if your supervisor doesn't know, then they ask their leader and they ask their leader and they ask their leader. Again, going back to that management construct of the inverted pyramid, we exist to support the associate and that frontline customer. And it starts from day one. So that when that when that associate and they will take a tough call and they will have a tough chat and they will need to step away and take a breather because it's a hard job. It's certainly been really hard the last 18 months. They know that I'm standing there right there with them. And they know that my leadership team is standing right there with them. And when you create that kind of a culture mm-hmm. and you 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 empower them in such a way to do whatever it takes, it's not like, well, let me ask my boss for approval. No, do it. Let me go to this process map and see if I no, do it. Take, do the yeah. right thing. We've all have a degree of humanity. I would much rather have, you know, millions of calls get it right, Aaron, on the side of humanity. And then a small fraction that may have gone overboard, then the other way around um, of upsetting people as a baseline, right? We've all, we all know, and I'm not going to name brands. We all know brands were like, <laughs> I've got to pick up the phone and call them. Um, and I won't name any cable company right now, right? <laughs> but <laughs> you but, don't have to. We, <laughs> we, we all know it, right? And yeah. so we've all experienced that. So it starts with, hey, let's not do that. Let's just do the right thing and, and we'll, we'll get you through it. Um, so we actually intentionally, Try to stay away from, we have a process, but you try to stay away from real scripted activities um, because ultimately you're talking to a human um, and we need to make that interaction feel as human as possible. And it starts with having empathy and de-escalation and listening skills and those soft skills, but it's got to be supported and backed by a level of empowerment. And if you have that, the customer is going to feel that and uh, and they'll walk away happier. Yeah, it's it's having that that backup, right? Knowing that you've got a, a leadership yeah. behind you so you can make, you can do what you feel is right. And then you've always got support someone that's got your back, right? It makes yeah. it much easier to do the right thing. And going back to what you said, we're, we're all, we're all experts. Everyone's had a bad experience. We've all had good experience. Since, and what I've was boggles my mind is the companies that still don't put out a good customer experience or a good customer service team, to cut, try to cut costs and all these things because they everyone knows what it's like to have a good and bad experience. So why would you ever put out a product or a service that has bad customer support? I just it blows my mind. But yeah, I mean it it shows with what you guys are doing. And one of the questions I have to follow up on that is what sort what sort of metrics do you track? If so, if it's not first call resolution, maybe because yep. you don't care about just getting them off. You want to get it solved, or you know maybe it's not. It wouldn't be wait time. It would be like first call resolution. But what sort of metrics do you guys track? Yeah, no, it's it's a, that- it's a great. I, I would say so. We track all of the kind of common um, metrics. I, I look. I, I believe it's important to answer the phone in a reasonable amount of time. I believe it's important um, to our shareholders to make sure that we're not just taking a taking a ten minute call and turning to twenty minutes. Because by the way, the customer's time is valuable too. But when mm-hmm. I talk about something like average handle time. I make sure it's through the lens of the customer experience. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in in, in, if you think about two scenarios, one would be, um, hey, let's let's wow the customer and stay on the phone with them as long as possible versus let's just solve the customer's question as quickly and as efficiently as we can. Most customers Mm -hmm. will err to the side of that. Like I'm calling you not because I'm walking down the street saying, I think I'll call the Home Depot 1-800 <laughs> number today. Something happened right. to trigger that. So, so, but it, it is it, messaging and how it's talked about is really meaningful because if you're just driving, uh, I put my air quotes in there, just driving handle time lower, then your associates are gonna feel that and the customer is gonna pick up on that. But if the messaging is around, hey, how do we most effectively and efficiently provide an effortless experience to the customer and make mm-hmm. that transaction as easy and as seamless as we possibly can, the customer is also going to pick up on that. And by the way, generally speaking, the cool part, the cool thing about this business is that oftentimes if you take cost out in the right way, you'll also get the customer benefit in feeling good about that cost. So if you're if it's a quicker call because you've resolved it quicker, mm-hmm. great. 
That's awesome. And by the way, it's less expensive. Um, and so we track handle time, we'll track speed of answer, but big ones to us are the likelihood to shop again number and then their satisfaction um, with our with our internal associate, what we call ASAT. So the associate satisfaction. And I view those both as one is kind of Home Depot general likelihood to shop again, and then specific to the experience um, with our with our folks with our with our associates it's it's that agent satisfaction associate satisfaction number but you know all all too often I'll, I'll i'll leave the metric discussion with this all too often we can get wrapped up too much in metrics because there's mm -hmm. a lot that goes into them so i'm always thoughtful about you kind of have to have a amalgamation of various metrics and understand what are the behaviors that we're trying to drive not just the result of the metric it's got to be linked to a behavior that you're trying to drive. And then that's how you bring it to life. Oh, I, I love that. Um, I, we were, we had another person on the podcast and they said that a contact center is a lot like a baseball team. You know, there's so many RBIs, home runs, like walks, all these things that you can measure. But in reality, you really need a manager to like a, a baseball manager to be able to say, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to pinch hit, you know, even though the stats may say, no, don't do it that yeah. way. It may change the game. Absolutely. So uh, one of the things I want to bring up was uh, leadership. So, uh, yeah. you know, in your role and, and a lot of the people who are listening to this podcast um, oversee a lot of team members, um, whether it's, you know, one or two or three, and then they report into 10 reporting to them, 10 reporting to them. Um, do you have any tips and tricks for a great leadership style, uh, career pathing maybe, or, allowing agents to go outside of their kind of structured box to learn a little bit more about something new so they can grow themselves. Talk, talk to us a little bit about leadership on the team. Yeah, sure. I mean, you mentioned a couple of things there. I don't know if any of these are great. I'll just kind of share with you what's, what's worked for me and what, what's resonated. Um, you have to lead with empathy. I think that's always been important. I think it's even more important uh, now than ever before. In fact, I, I, I was at a, I was delivering a, uh, a speaking engagement or part of a panel on a, on a stage with a with an industry group in New Orleans about four years ago. And the question was asked, what's the most important management trait you think is going to be needed for the next 10 years? Mm. I didn't know what I was forecasting, but I said empathy. Um, and it is more important now than ever before. Just just this morning, I had two separate um, what uh, what we call you know town halls or moments with Mike because we got to brand everything. And it's just <laughs> a, I, I do them with every single group every single leadership team, um, several several layers up or down the organization, depending on how you want to look at it, but several layers removed. And it's my time with them. It's completely unfiltered. It's whatever they want to talk about. Um, and we talked from a range of the supply chain issues to personally how COVID had affected me and my family. So mm -hmm. a mass, you know, vast of, of different discussion topics. But we had, we had uh, two of them. Each one was an hour this morning. And I do those every single month with all of my leaders and their leaders and their leaders. I try to I try to reach down to every leader in the organization so That's that great. I am making sure that I'm listening and I'm hearing. Most of it just ends up being a, a good rah-rah, but there's always a nugget or two. There's always a nugget or two that I'm like, okay, I need to apply that in the next effort or the next week or, or whatever my plans are. It's also a good gut check, right? How effective is, is my vision as a leader being yeah. shared throughout the organization. So it's a really good gut check for that. Um, yeah. And so I would say that's a good best practice. Um, the other one is, is and, I, and I said the word earlier, humanity when it came to the customer experience, but I would also say on the associate experience, being a human and being a good listener and understanding that, that you know, certainly in a virtual world, kids are going to come running into the room at any given time mine are going to be home and you'll probably hear them hear them come in and we'll have to edit and cut it in post-production but they're <laughs> going to be here right and yep. we should never apologize for that because that's going to happen telling your team that that's okay and that life is going to happen will put you in a light of humanity that you may never have even seen yourself but they'll see you that way um and so those are just just two good ones communicate 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 i cannot tell you how how incredible it was to work for an organization of our size, 450,000 people, 120 plus billion dollars, and to watch us be able to communicate with the speed that we were able to do. 
but that was because we had the trust and we had the empathy and we had the humanity and we had everything built on a foundation. But um, the f- speed and frequency of communication is another critical trait to uh, to lead through any time, but certainly through challenging times. Yeah, you know, and from what we've talked to other leaders on the podcast, you know, we hear a lot of different varieties of like of their leadership styles, things that they find important. Empathy is definitely a big one that we hear now for sure. Um, but what's nice and like what, what, what you see happening is that when they have that empathy, there's trust and that humanity and it builds trust. Yeah. When something difficult comes up or that difficult conversation comes up, you're, you're communi- and then you're communicating. Right. And so like it, you can, I think you can rally them more and lead and lead them to that through whatever it is that's going on. If it's, I don't know if it's an associate on the store floor being tardy all the, you know, being late to work, or mm-hmm. if it's someone in the contact mm-hmm. center, just, you know, whatever it is. Right. But I think being able to have those things in place and that leadership style in place lends you the ability to, Hey, like it's time to buck, you know, buck up and get, you know, fix this thing. And you can, I think you can lead with a more fervor. I don't know if that's the way to say it, but how do you see no, that? You're lead, at, I, you know? I think, yeah. I think you're, you're, you're absolutely right. When there's trust and it comes from a good place and there's empathy and it's all built on a strong foundation, when there are challenging times, um, it, it's easier to make it through. You know, there's, there's that phrase, nature abhors a vacuum. Um, and, and in the corporate world, business world, you know, people will fill a vacuum of information, generally speaking, not with positive stuff. It will generally be negative, right? Uh, and there's a vacuum out there. And if you can shift that culture to say, no, 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 I, that's not what he meant to say or he meant to do, or there's a level of trust there that people fill that void with when they fill it with positivity and they fill it with trust versus negativity. That doesn't happen overnight. It happens because of a very intentional culture that, that is developed. But you're right, it does make it easier um, because Lord knows there was challenges that, that we faced that we never planned on. And there was a lot of extra hours spent and a lot of weekends and a lot of nights. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and that's okay when there's a trust and understanding. The other thing, the other thing, and I don't think this gets talked about enough, is that, you know, the leaders are generally the dumbest people in the organization. Uh, and I've said that to my team quite often. I am the dumbest person in the organization because I'm the furthest from the customer. Yeah. And I'm the furthest from the frontline associate. So if I can empower and create a culture of speed and trust of communication, I will instantly become smarter because I'm going to get more information. I'm going to have a higher degree of receptivity created in the organization. There's going to be a higher level of honesty and candor. And when you do that as a leader, you get better information. You get yeah. better feedback. You have people who will help you make sure that you don't make, you may be the dumbest person in the organization, but you don't have to make a dumb decision because your people can help insulate you yep. by giving you the good information. I use insulation in a positive way there. Mm-hmm. Um, if you do not have that, you will be insulated, but you will be insulated from the truth and you will be insulated from bad news because people will be fearful of telling you that. And that's the opposite end of that coin. And I've seen that play out play out over, over my years as well. Uh, I, I would much rather live in a, in a level of radical transparency and radical honesty and radical candor because it makes life easier. It makes it more clear. And your whole team picks up on that as well. It's a great point, Alex. Yeah, yeah now that you have a lot of your associates working from home, um, in smaller like individuals versus small pods, how do you um, allow them to be a part, feel like they're a part of the, the brand or the, how do you create this sense of community that they're, you know, one of many and we're all in it together. Uh, any tips and tricks? Yeah, no, it, it is. So, so you mentioned something that keeps me up at night, uh, which is, how do we still pe- keep people engaged when they're when they're on a screen, right? And everything's and everything's two D. And you said a phrase there: "We're all in this together." And I've and I've said I've taken a saying: "We're not all we're in the same ocean, but we're all in different boats." I have no idea what kind of boat you're in. You have no idea what kind of boat I'm in. And so there needs to be that level of transparency so that we're we're talking a common common language. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a couple of things that, that have that have worked well. I have a standing literally; it's a Teams link. Um, that anyone can click on and just 
that it's a it's an hour a week we've cut back on it because it got to the point where people were like i've seen jones enough i don't want to i don't want to see him anymore um but it was just kind of an open door session and really where it started was in april may of 2020 and when we got through kind of some of the craziness just probably late summer actually where i was like okay what is how do we create a water cooler how do we create a virtual water cooler where you have people that would normally do a drive by hey in your office hey come on in here or you're walking around the floor talking to people how do you create that virtually and i said we're just going to have a two hour gap and i'm going to launch teams and i'm going to block off my calendar for two hours and anybody who clicks on the link we're having a conversation um and look most people would say, I'm not sure about that. But then what starts to happen is you have one or two and two or three, and then somebody somebody chats up somebody else, say, get in here, I'm talking to Jones, good discussion going on. And then it starts to spread. And we saw that play out. We backed off that because it really became like, now people will just ping me a note or shoot something out to me and we'll have conversations on it. Uh, and we try to stay away from the, the hierarchical aspects of things. And when you do that, it, it certainly helps. It's tough though, it is, it is tough. And I think it goes back to just, being empathetic, making sure that you're, as a leader, you're reaching out to your team individually. Mm -hmm. uh, it, not everything has to be a formal meeting. Not everything has to be scheduled. It can be, hey, I've got just a free time and, I'm, and I'm, I haven't talked to Shirley today. I'm going to click on it and just, just call in and say, hey, what's up? Yeah. Um, and so we're all kind of learning as we go through like, do I schedule a meeting? Do I just call somebody, but they're in their house, but their house is their office? Like, how do I navigate through that? I don't have the right answer, but I but I do go back to the foundational principles of of trust and candor and honesty and empathy. Mm -hmm. um, if you have those, good things will come out of that. Yeah, well, well said, well said. So we're running up against time a little bit here, Michael. So what I'd like to do is one of the things Artie and I like to do at the end of a podcast is talk about an amazing experience that you've had with a brand, not Home Depot, because we know you guys are great, but another brand where you're like, wow, that that took me by surprise or they messed up, but they fixed it. Right. Or something like that. If you have something like that in mind, if not, you can choose option B, which would be maybe an experience from one of your associates or someone on your team that you said, wow, they did a really good job at this. I've got plenty of them. <laughs> so go for it. Um, can I name the brand? Yeah, absolutely. Sure, yeah, it's, yeah. it's it's a it's a it's a it's a positive story. Um, so um, I recently traveled to Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, to go attend the uh, Georgia Clemson kickoff for Chick Fil A college <laughs> season. Right, Charlotte, North Carolina, ACC SEC classic matchup. Go dogs, by the way. And so um, it was clear that Charlotte was not ready to host an event of that magnitude. But the reality of it is, is that who would be ready? Who would be ready to, to welcome in, you know, coming out the first big game of the college football season, only being a couple of months removed from stadiums, you know, not allowing people. Um, and so uh, Hilton, I had a I had a uh, I had an experience with Hilton where the room was overbooked and I was frustrated. And I wasn't sure if I was going to get a room or not. And I had booked this room back in January, uh, you know, months and months before. And so I sent off a, a, a nice email, but a clear and candid email. I got a call from the general manager, couldn't apologize, couldn't have done a better job of apologizing enough, but then rectifying the problem. And they had to go out and they had to actually buy a room from another hotel that they paid wow. for, but they made it right. And it was, you know, it was another hundred yards down the street, but you got to understand a hundred thousand people were descending mm -hmm. on Charlotte. There wasn't a hotel room. There literally was not a hotel room. The wow. only other hotel room that could have been captured was 20 miles outside of the city. And I didn't want to drive. And I was taking my seven year old son up there. So I was, I was pretty like pretty upset. And for the hotel general manager to have called me personally, and then to have gone to a competitor, it proved to me that it wasn't about revenue. It wasn't about, you know, anything else other than I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to do the right mm -hmm. thing and I'm going to take care of this customer. And they did. And it was a, it, what could have been a very negative story turns into a yeah. story that I'm, that I'm sharing positive vibes about, but it came down to the right person and the right culture being empowered to do the right thing. Uh, and I experienced that just, you know, three or four weeks ago. And of course, making things better was that my beloved UGA Bulldogs beat Clemson and are currently 4-0. So That's very right. happy about that. That's right. They're doing great this year. What a, what a good story. What a great story. Because 
the big brands that get it right, it just perpetuates. And now you're telling the story to us, you're telling the story to others and you trust the brand. There's loyalty that's built into that. It's not that just one-time experience and yeah, they lost money on it, but the long run, they're not losing any money on it. So yep. absolutely a great story. Michael, it's been a pleasure having you on the podcast and thank you so much for taking your time to be with us today. No, thank, thanks for having me. It's been great chatting with you. Appreciate the interruption and otherwise dull day of work. This was a, <laughs> a great discussion and certainly enjoyed it. Good. And Artie, you want last words, last words from you? No, pleasure as always. I'm a, a 20 year plus a loyal customer of the Home Depot will continue to be forever. I actually live in a town called Tustin, uh, which is in Orange County. And I have got two Home Depots within, I think, three miles both ways. So I, I have to figure out which store I'm loyal to because they're both amazing. So absolute pleasure having you on the, the podcast. And Alex, pleasure as always to have you as my co-host. Uh, looking forward to everyone else joining us on our next episode. Thanks again. Well, that wraps up the show for today. Thanks for joining. And don't forget to join us next week as we bring another guest in to talk about the trends around Cloud Contact Center and customer experience. Also, you can find us at AdlerAdvisors.com, LinkedIn, or your favorite podcast platform. We'll see you next week on another Cloud Podcast. <laughs>